Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Kativ's Autodesk Virtual Academy. Today is uh, April 26th. I'm Nigel Lombayek, your host for today and application engineer here at Kativ. Uh, as you can see, I'm joined by Nikhil. Hey, Nikhil, how's it going? Good, you? I'm good. I can't, I'm not even going to bother pronouncing your last name. I'm going to get it wrong. Um, but uh, if you do remember, a couple of weeks ago, Nikhil was on for a NASRAN NCAD webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, Nikhil, that was about elements and meshing in NASRAN NCAD. That was almost a a fundamental sort of um, approach to mm -hmm. elements and today the idea is to look go more in detail on on pretty much all of those concepts and try to give users more of a comprehensive understanding of how elements and meshes work and in that right. certainly um but with that i think we'll go ahead and get started um thanks all for being here today and uh i'll see you on the other side so go ahead nikhil yeah right, thanks angel so just an outline um, on what we are planning to do today. First of all, I just want to recap what we did last time. Uh, in case you didn't join us last time, I would urge you to take a look at that just so you get a better understanding of, of this one. Um, but if you did join us last time, welcome back. So we will recap what we did last time. And we'll also go a little bit more, uh, a little bit deeper into certain things like element orders. We touched on that last time around. We we talked about a few rules of thumb, but today we'll understand how those rules of thumb come about and why they actually exist. Mesh convergence, uh, we'll again discuss that and why that's important, how that's important, how it's going to help you validate your results, which is, of course, one of the most important things uh, we're looking to do in any FEA study. And then we'll jump into a live demonstration, which uh, we'll we'll spend some time on that, and we'll spend some time going through the different um, the different concepts we cover here. So we'll finish that. I'll round that off with a summary of what we did last time, what we did this time, and a Q and A session. So with that, let's get started. So last time we first of all started off uh, by talking about the general FEA process, and we also defined what elements and nodes are. We talked about the different types of elements available in, in NASTRA and NCAD. That's solid elements, shell elements, and line elements, or 1D, 2D, 3D elements. Uh, we went over how we can refine the mesh in areas of stress concentration. Like, for example, how do you get the, uh, the mesh around an area of discontinuity, like a hole or a sharp corner? How do you get that to? more con conform to the geometry more correctly. And we also discussed idealizations, which is essentially how uh, NASR and NCAD puts different elements together um, in order to, for, for a complete assembly. And you can use multiple types of um, idealizations in one single study for multiple parts in an assembly. Finally, we also touched a little bit on convergence and that's something we will go into a lot more detail on today. Now, going back to the elements, uh, we did talk about the element order a little bit briefly last time. If you remember, uh, we discussed that there are two different kinds of two different element orders available in NASTRA and NCAD, linear and parabolic. The only difference between linear and parabolic elements are the shape functions and the nodal mass distributions. So the a 2D uh, triangular element, a shell element, is a linear element is likely to have three nodes, as you would expect. The mass is going to be distributed in, um, in these ratios on each node. Similarly, for a quad element, you would expect it to have uh, four nodes and the mass will be distributed in these unequal ratios. But as we mentioned, parabolic elements have an additional mid-side node along each edge. So a, a parabolic triangular element is probably, is, is likely to look like this. But the distribution of mass is not exactly intuitive because what you are going to see is that the mid-side nodes are actually divided in, in equal ratios, 
while the corner nodes have absolutely no mass distribution. It's, it gets even more complex for quad, uh, for parabolic quad elements, because now you have a third on each mid-side node and you actually have load in the opposite direction on the corner nodes, which again is not exactly intuitive. So um, the choice of element is important for the accuracy of solution and for controlling the uh, solve time. Now what this, this also goes to show you is that if you're not sure about um, how the element is going to behave in and of itself, then to expect a certain um, a certain kind of behavior in in an assembly or in a large design is probably going to be unrealistic, and uh, those incorrect assumptions are likely to snowball and throw off your results by by a pretty large, significant number. The good news is, however. Um, it is recommended that we use linear elements for as much as possible when we're using 2D elements, when we're using shell elements. Also, the good news is parabolic solid elements are really good general purpose elements. So you don't really have to worry about mass distribution on solid elements, at least not all the time. Now, there are certain, certain conditions where Linear elements are better than parabolic elements. Parabolic are better than linear elements. Parabolic elements, for example, perform uh, much better than linear elements in areas of high stresses, high deformations, because, as you would imagine, there is an additional node there, so there's one more point that um, that it's that can capture the behavior of the element. Let's talk about mesh convergence. Let's talk about what that means, why that is important, and why that's maybe a little more important than, than uh, some of you may have, some of us may have imagined. Now, it doesn't take much for a finite element analysis to produce some results. Uh, the study will spit out a solution as long as the basic rules of physics are satisfied. Now, a good way to ensure that your results are accurate is to perform you know, several iterations of, of your simulation with decreasing mesh size. When I say decreasing mesh size, I mean the number of ele the element count is, is increased and the uh, size of the element is reduced. So eventually, so what you're likely to see is your results will improve, and but eventually they will level off at some point, and further increasing, uh, further increasing the mesh density is going to have little or no, or sometimes even uh, counterproductive effect on on the results. So when the mesh, when the stress change becomes not so significant between any two successive mesh iterations, say, you know, if, if the change is less than one or 2%, then we have achieved what is called uh, mesh convergence or results convergence. Now, again, as you can probably imagine, displacement results are likely to converge um, quicker than stress results do. But when you have, once you've demonstrated mesh convergence, you can start to feel confident about the accuracy of those results. Now, following conversions, additional mesh refinement, like we see here, does not necessarily affect uh, the results, the, the actual solution. Now, at this point, the model and the mesh are sort of independent of each other, or the results in the mesh are independent of each other in this solution is called a mesh independent solution. So let's take a look at that real quick. Hopefully I don't have to deal with dialog boxes. Now, some of you who have been um, 
in the Autodesk world for a while, may have seen this before, but may have seen this model before. And while it seems like a perfectly good idea to do this over a simulate this entire model on a webcast, I think we will resist that temptation and just try and analyze this one little arm here. So that's all I want to analyze. Um, so we'll, you, we'll run a simple linear static analysis. Notice that we already have surface contacts in. That's because this is a series of, of pieces that are meant to be welded together. And we just want to apply some very simple constraints on this. So start by creating some connectors. So rigid body connectors. I want to select that, those two surfaces. Get a point at the center of that. Do the same thing on the other end as well. Center. And we'll apply constraints to that point right there. Uh, we'll fix that fully. We will make sure that surface is pinned and apply a load on this end. That'll be in the FC direction. Let's say a load of um, minus 10,000 Newton, or let's say 100,000 Newton, just for the sake of it. OK. So now we can remember, this is, this is a component in a massive machine. So your element size is actually going to seem larger than it normally would. So if I look at my mesh settings, I'm going to start off with, with an element size of 20. If I generate that mesh, we can see it's, it's, it's quite fine. It is seemingly OK. Um, and since we have all of our idealizations and all of our um, contacts and everything in, we should be good to run this, run this model. But the idea behind, behind solving this is to look at what areas are going to be stressed, what can we do to improve the results in, in that area, and how are we going to be confident that what we did is indeed correct. So this is going to take a second to finish running. And while Nikhil's doing that, Nikhil, you added the point in between the two um, the two holes there, mm -hmm. and that's where you're applying the fixed constraints as well yep. as the the Blue. loads. What difference does that make versus having you know applying that to both uh, both holes per se? Applying that to both holes um, essentially means that you're applying it to these surfaces, which may or may not actually be the way um, the design operates. So, what's more likely to happen is that there's a shaft running through this. And it's that shaft that, that actually holds this together. So it's not necessarily being held together. It, it's not necessarily being fixed at this point. It's just that there's something running through this, which is going to be fixed. So we create these rigid body constraints, and we fix those constraints instead. It's the same thing for the load. So anyway, um, if you're looking at the results, I have the safety factor plot up here. But if we're looking at the solid one meter stress results, let me turn off some of these things. So we're looking at those results. We you look at the maximum stress. It's in this region as you would expect. But is there a way we can make this um, that we can you know we can make this finer? Does this have enough number of elements? We don't know that. So let's let's see what what making the mesh finer does. Hit return. Um, I have this mesh control button, and I want to select, or rather, I want to refine this based on by selecting edges. So I just want to select these edges. 
here. Now you could also select the surface of the face, but selecting the edges means that you're controlling the endpoints, not just the actual um, elements themselves. So I want to change that. At the moment, it's 20. I want to change that element size to 5. So it's a big change. And I will regenerate that mesh. You see that that region now has a lot more elements. And we'll do the same thing. We'll run the model again. We want to see um, what the effect of this is going to be. Now, like Nick, oh, go ahead, Nickel. Uh, now, again, remember, um, we just increased the element count. So we're now going to have to wait just a little longer for the, for the model to finish running. Yep. I know that, uh, you know, I got a little excited one time when doing one of these simulations. I tried to refine the mesh like to some ridiculous amounts. Um, and it may or may not have blown up a computer. <laughs> so uh, just make sure that it is within reason. You don't want to have millions upon millions of elements in something. Obviously, like Nikhil said, there you get to a point where adding more elements isn't really going to do anything to your results except for make them take way longer. Um, so just keep that in mind when doing mm -hmm. simulations. So now you see that, notice there is an actual change in the results. Um, now, I don't know what that means, actually. I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know if it's a bad thing. So I want to refine it further and see what's, what's going on. I don't know if, if my assumptions are correct to begin with. So again, go back into this mesh control. So change this from 5 to, say, 1. Now, again, you can you can also see why we want to do this locally and not on a global scale, because we don't want to change. We don't really care about what's happening in this region. That's that's pretty safe. And no matter how much we refine it, I think intuitively it seems like it's going to be safe. This is the region we're interested in. Again, this has thousands of elements at this point. So we shouldn't have to refine it any further. But let's see. And like Nikhil mentioned, this is going to take a little bit more time. There's a few more elements. But uh, in this case, we might get some validity in regards to the results. Um, this is one way to do it, right? You want to keep going smaller in element type or element size, not element type, um, until you get to a point where your results pretty much don't change um, as you're getting you know, larger and larger in the element count. Um, so while we're waiting for this to happen, we will just uh, look at this screen, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it shouldn't be much longer. Yeah, that's, the, that's the one really cool thing about Nastran is that it solves really, really quickly. Yep, and all of this is happening locally. And I um, just want everyone to note, too, that Nikhil's not on a supercomputer by any means. He's on, actually, he's on a laptop. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not like back in the day when you need some crazy machine to run these things and perhaps like things like uh, you know, farms of yep. computing power not necessary anymore. And considering how many elements and how many nodes we have here, I think that was that was pretty quick. About thirty seconds runtime was pretty good. Sixty thousand elements and hundred plus k nodes. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, now you look at our stress values, and it's not too different. We went from an element size of five millimeters to an element size of one millimeter. So we essentially reduced it by five times, and the stress values didn't exactly change. So we can confidently say that we're approaching convergence at this point. Now, what does that mean for our displacement? Now, if we had looked at our displacement values earlier, we would have seen that this, this peak value was actually reached quite a while ago. The displacement values converge, almost always converge a lot quicker than the stress values do. Um, didn't mean to click on that. But if we also look at the safety factor, right, that is something that um, will also, it'll tell you a lot earlier than the stress values normally might. It'll tell you if the, if the design is safe, approaching safety. Um, It'll probably do that a lot quicker than than stress convergence would. So if you change the 
the scale of that, we can see the safety factor plot much better. So there we go. So this is the portion that is least safe, as again, you would expect. But if you, if you go back and look, then you'll see that this safety factor value doesn't, doesn't change much um, across. The, once the displacement converges, the safety factor is not going to change too much. Yep, and what Nikhil did there to change, you know, if you notice, it was all red um, before, noting that the safety factor in all of those blue areas was like in thousands mm -hmm. or hundreds. Um, and what he did, he just changed the scale of that legend there on the left to go from 1 to 10 instead of like 1.7 to it's like 900 or something. Because yeah. um, at that point, right, anything above, you know, 100 is going to be show up as bright red. Yeah. Um, or sorry, below 100 is going to show up as bright red. Um, so that's just one way to look at it. You really don't care about the regions that there are no stress concentrations. Um, so you can change the scale to do that. Um, when you look at safety factor, a lot of the graphs are going to look like this. Um, it just happens to happen based on, you know, what your model is. Um, and one way to be able to look at that more intuitively is to go into the plot options and just change the minimums and maximums. So just uh, in, anyone, if, in case anyone missed that, uh, yeah. that 15 seconds there. Right. So notice you also have um, under the result options, under other, you will also have the solid mesh convergence error. Now this in and of itself is not something we should take at face value. But if you, oops, if you right click on this and generate a report, then you will see, um, there you go. So that's, that's what the report will look like. This, a lot of the stuff is, is, you know, just default. I haven't bothered changing it. But if you scroll down to the solution section, then you'll see that you have these two quantities here. You have the solution error measure, and you have the solid element relative stress error. This relative stress error is, is a factor of, um, is actually a derived quantity from this solid mesh convergence error. So there's, a, there's some complex math involved, but the good thing is the report does that math for you. Um, <clears throat> anything less than uh, 0.01, now this is for an older one, it's for a much more coarse mesh, but anything uh, greater than 0.01, is, which is anything greater than 1%, means that you can refine your mesh a little more. Anything less than 0.01 tells you that your mesh is, or your solution is, a, is approaching a mesh independent solution, or it is a mesh independent solution. Um, the solution error measure is, this is something that, that most FEA packages um, are going to do, are likely to do, is that you will see that this, uh, so most FEA packages will give you um, an option of averaging results either to the nodes or to the elements. So depending on what you choose and depending on what gets calculated, um, this is just the average error. Now, I'm not sure if this is the average error or this is the root mean square error, but if this is the error between that calculated value and that displayed value. So again, common sense says you don't want this to be very high. You don't want this to be significant at all. So if you, again, if, if you're not sure about what these means, you can click on them, scroll down, and you see that in the glossary here, there's, um, there's a definition, so values greater than 0.01 may indicate that further mesh refinement is required. And same thing with the solution error mesh. Values less than e to the minus seven are generally considered acceptable. So this is just a good way to make sure that you don't have uh, garbage results and make sure that you don't have results that you can potentially improve. So, any questions about this? There's a couple of questions um, before we 
move on here a little bit that I just want to address mm -hmm. um, as we're getting some of these. <clears throat> Colin mentions um, when doing mesh conversions, say for example for von Mises stress, his experience is the opposite of what we're suggesting. When he adds more mesh or more elements, um, his results diverge from the actual. Um, are there ways to explain this? And uh, I think the first thing that I would do is when you're starting to get really wonky results and they're perhaps diverging from what you think they're supposed to be doing, um, run a modal analysis on your simulation. Um, so Nikhil, if you want to jump into NCAD real quick. Yeah. Um, and run a modal analysis on this to find the natural frequency. Um, if you run those modal analyses, analyses per se, <clears throat> you're going to get um, some results from that modal analysis. And that modal analysis should give you an exaggeration of what's going to happen um, to this model. And it looks like Nikhil found his dialog box. No, just... I, I tried editing this and it's stuck there. I can't move it now. Oh, that's not, not good. Um, but anyways. Um, if you run a modal analysis and the results from that are showing you displacement that you don't think is going to happen, there's probably something wrong with your idealizations. Um, maybe there's you know some sort of connector that's not in place. Uh, maybe you didn't apply the loads in the proper direction per se. Um, that would be my only explanation to that. If you're if you, you know you run a modal analysis and it's running as expected, um, let us know and uh, you know myself and Nikhil can spend some time with you and figure out what's going on yeah, that, um, because that's the complete opposite mm -hmm. of what's expected. Well, that can also mean that the type of element being used is not suitable to the type of analysis being run. Yep. Uh, so, for example, or the material model doesn't doesn't work. So, for example, if you're using an isotropic material or you, you're using uh, uh, linear static analysis for a non for analysis that should be nonlinear, then at some point it's going to stop making sense. Mm -hmm. This could be that point. <laughs> yeah, so it really so, depends on what it is. But um, for basic rule of thumb, 90% of situations, run a modal, run see a what's going analysis. on. And it, that, that should give you an idea of what constraints are missing, if any. Yep. So, uh, anything else? Yeah, there's a couple more, but we'll even cover those um, okay. at the end. So you can keep moving to kill. All right. Anyway, so it's a good thing this showed up. So we can, this is 0.1 inches. OK, perfect. So now notice we have this shell idealization. Uh, we can get rid of the solid one. We don't need it. We can keep it, doesn't matter. But we're just going to give this some kind of material. So select a material. Let's say alloy steel for this. Hit OK. Now, since this is, say, one foot long, I will say, so let's say we're going to create linear elements, and each is going to be three inches long. So if we generate a mesh, as you would expect, we will have 10 nodes and four elements. And that's fine. Now, let's set up constraints um, on those edges there. I just want to fix those. And set up loads. Let's say minus it's pound force. OK, so I say minus 5,000 in the, oops, in the negative y direction. So that's what we want, right? So essentially, this is going to be a simple plate that's fixed on either side with a force, a point load being applied, uh, rather a force being applied along the surface downwards. So if we go run that, just say. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I won't let you run it unless you save the actual model. And since yeah. I built this model in about 30 seconds, I haven't saved it yet. So. <laughs> OK. Now, there is something off about this. One is, of course, we don't have enough elements. And that's fine. But second is you don't actually see bending. You, you expect there to be, on every single one of these individual plates, you would expect there to be uh, and some actual bending and not just linear bending along the edges. So essentially, if you consider this this element here, this is behaving like a cantilever beam with a load just on one end, which is not true because there's actually a load on the entire surface. Let's look at the displacement on that. And we're just going to use this as reference. So it's about four inches. 
Now, if we go back in and change this to hyperbolic element, changing nothing else, right? So we have four elements, and we have 23 nodes now instead of 10. So that's a lot more points to calculate the displacement, calculate the stresses, and also capture the behavior, which is important. So I didn't change anything else. I'm just going to hit run. So sometimes with simple problems like this one, now notice this. You see that each individual element is actually undergoing different um, loading phases, so to speak. So this one now has mid-side nodes. So those mid-side nodes take the load as well. So they react to the load as well. And even though the displacement is, well, the displacement has changed um, by, what, 0 0.7? 0 0.7 of an inch, which is significant when, when the total displacement is only 4 inches. So imagine when uh, this snowballs and this sort of like, propagates to a much larger assembly. Point here is it's important to us to understand how your material is, how your element is going to behave, how you expect your model to behave beforehand, and to see whether that element is actually going to be able to model that sort of behavior. Because the linear element um, simply cannot model this kind of behavior. So this is something that is a very important to keep in mind. And if you if you're not sure about how it's going to behave, then I just say run it with both and see which one is more intuitive. <clears throat> so I'm glad Nigel managed to uh, <laughs> managed to do this, managed to build the model and everything. Yeah, it wasn't very difficult. <laughs> it wasn't very difficult, but hey, I couldn't even find the dialog box. Yeah, so. <laughs> my dialog box happened to uh, live in like the corner of my screen, unlike the kills, which. Uh, <clears throat> Which like flew into like two screens across when he only has two screens, so became a little bit of an issue there. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give Nikhil back the presentation, um, so we can jump into Q and A. So, uh, doo -doo -doo. bam, awesome, perfect, cool. So hopefully that made sense. Okay, all right. Now, to summarize, in case I haven't mentioned this already, elements in mesh affect the accuracy of the FEA solution. Understanding the behavior of, of elements is essential before you set up the, uh, the study. And it's important because, as we saw there, the behavior of your system can, can change quite dramatically depending on what kind of element you use. Now, linear elements, again, rule of thumb, linear elements are preferred for nonlinear structural analyses, especially um, if they're going to be 2D, uh, as we discussed earlier, because of the uneven distribution of, of masses and loads. And finally, mesh conversions is a very important metric to determine the accuracy of your FEA results, or at least it's the first, the most fundamental metric uh, that helps determine the accuracy. And once you have that, once you know your mesh is not the problem, you can then start to think about, are my constraints OK? Am I, have I set it up OK? Has, you know, does this represent real world behavior and re real, the actual geometry? So um, this, is, this is definitely one of the hurdles that, that you want to uh, overcome when you want to verify your results. And with that, let's open the floor to some questions. Yeah, there's a lot of questions that came through. Um, so I'm going to answer most of them. Um, there's some questions I'm probably going to have to take offline. So if I don't answer your question, I will make sure Nikhil emails you directly um, to go ahead and answer these. So Nikhil, there's just a few. Okay that we're going to need to do that for. Some of these longer questions, I would assume, mm -hmm. might get a little crazy. Um, so quick question. Um, 
when you're performing these mesh refinements on specific areas, Nikhil, you, you selected some edges when right. doing so. Um, is there a way for the program to automatically know where those things are and perform the mesh automatically, or is it all a human thing, understanding where those um, those stress areas of stress concentration are? And to uh... not it's not necessarily a human thing. So the program will do some of it, right? For example, I didn't do anything with this little hole, but it knows that there's some kind of discontinuity there. This just looks like a little pinhole, but it knows there's some kind of discontinuity there, and it adapts the mesh accordingly but then again it doesn't it doesn't do a perfect job of it if you notice look at the front view that's yeah, not perfectly circular it's not perfectly circular and while the distribution around it is pretty good it can still be improved so if this if this is important to the analysis then yes you would want to do this manually and so to answer that question there are ways for it to automatically adapt the mesh to some of those areas of discontinuity, um, which is generally where your stress concentrations are going to be. They're not going to be in the middle of the plate mm -hmm. unless you like apply the force yeah. at some point in the middle of the plate. Um, but there is no way for it to take the results of your analysis and then refine the mesh accordingly, um, if that's your question. So, so to answer that question, Jake, adaptive mesh happens. Um, but it's not as a result of a previous study. No. It's just as a result of discontinuity in the model itself. Um, how do you generate the report, Nikhil? Where, where is that button? Oh, so you right-click on analysis. You need to make sure it's saved, first of all. Right-click and generate report. Yeah, and then it sends you like this HTML file, if I yeah. remember correctly, mm -hmm. that opens in like your internet browser. Yeah. Um, so. And, you know, you can, um, I had a lot of just default values or default data in here, order as customer, order as customer, etc. But all of this is essentially customizable. You can choose what goes into the summary, for example. Um, yeah, and if you're you like really, really creative and kind of know how to mess with a couple of things, you can like really, mm -hmm. really, really customize this. Yeah. Um, don't try if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you have to edit some files, yeah. <laughs> uh, which could break the yeah, which could break the whole program. So definitely don't do that. Um, <laughs> Question, can you mix different types of elements, shells, solids, and lines into a single model? Into a single model? If the model is an assembly, then yes. Yeah, if it's multi-body, then sure. But if, if it's a single body? If it's a single part with multiple features, then no. You wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, so the yes and no, depending on uh, what you're actually trying to mix mm -hmm. the elements are. But it happens all the time, right? Some of your assemblies have sheet metal components. Um, and then there's other like solid components mm -hmm. in there. Uh, you're going to want to apply, say, for example, shell elements to that sheet metal component versus solid elements to, I don't know, something else. Again, that's something we went over in the last ABA. Yeah. So so uh, that, that link is to get put in the chat earlier. Mm -hmm. um, if you look for Nikhil's face on YouTube, I mean, just don't look for his face. Search <laughs> the right thing, right? You're not going to look through all of the videos there and do that. So all right. Let's see. I run into the single, or I run into the missing dialog box all the time when I switch from multiple to single screen. The best way to fix it is to quickly adjust your computer screen resolution, and then the dialog boxes come back. This is true. Um, I didn't want to kill to do that during the presentation um, because it would have broken a bunch of other stuff. Um, so yes, um, for those of you who are running into that issue where you have dialog boxes elsewhere when you say unplug your computer from external monitors, um, so on and so forth change the screen resolution, and then change it back. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> all of them show up. Um, there's also a hotkey to move uh, windows from screen to screen. Um, and sometimes that works, too. I think it's like Alt-Shift-M, something like that. Alt-Space-M, that might be it. And then arrow keys. So that is one thing. Let's keep looking. Um, are there other types of elements available, uh, for example, hexahedral elements in NASH and in CAD? No, we don't have hexahedral elements. We do not have hexes in, in CAD. Um, and that question gets asked a lot. I was with mm -hmm. some of the devs for Autodesk, um, for NASH and in CAD, um, when I went over some of this. And uh, they've come to the conclusion that quads are like sufficient for like 90-something percent of situations. Yes. Um, sorry, not. Yeah, not quads, tets. Um, quad, no, don't use quads in every situation. That would be bad. Tets. Um, 
are more than sufficient for most situations. Um, if you've got some something crazy that you need to use hexes for, um, let us know, and we can see if there's a way to, you know, mess with that. Um, in regards to, there's more questions. In regards to contact sizing, can you change that in InCAD? Contact um, sizing. I think I'm going to need to get a little bit more yeah, we, information mm -hmm. on what you mean by contact sizing. Um, if you want to give us a use case or a example in a question, I'll I'll take a look at that too. Um, um, when you refine the mesh locally, um, you selected an edge. What happens, or what's the best way to do it? If, say, for example, that edge is like super super long, um, say for example a loop, um, and you only really want like one part of it, what's the easiest way to go ahead and select maybe a portion of that edge? Um, instead of having to, say, model it that way? Um, well, you don't necessarily have to select the portion of an edge. So if I want to select, say, just that region, I can mesh control. I can select vertices if I want to. So if I had points there, I can change points. But otherwise, it would be difficult without. Yeah, you would have to split the face in the model. Modeling it that way. Yeah, and if even if not split the face, at least split the edge. Yeah, or split the edge. So there's there's a couple of ways to do it. So you might have to go into your model. That's another thing too is building your models for simulation. That's like a completely. That's another AVA in itself. <laughs> um, yeah, and whether or not to bring things like hardware into simulation, yeah. you generally a no no. Um, Absolutely no. Especially <laughs> screws. No. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, just keep that in mind. Sometimes you have to build your model to the analysis. And uh, sometimes it's just a case of splitting the, the face or mm -hmm. splitting the edges. Um, with that, I think that's all the questions we'll cover today. Um, Nikhil, again, thanks for being here today. If anyone has any suggestions for the next Nastrant NCAD webinar topic or CFD or whatever, um, let us know in the survey response after this. So you're going to get a survey um, once you exit the webinar or I boot you by ending it. Um, Please fill out some of that information there, and that'll help us drive what Nikhil will be doing next in six to eight weeks. So uh, with that, thank you all for being here today. Um, Nikhil, thank you for uh, being here every you know, every couple of weeks. I guess every day, right, because you're just in our office. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, if you have any questions, go ahead and send them over to um, Nikhil's email address, which is nikhil.bencat.com, or even easier than that, um, just send them to questions at kativ.com, and I'll make sure they get to the right person. Um, so again, thanks, and we'll see you next week.